thank you all the pol politicians who are like, what do you like better, moms or guns? Well, it's not either or, you can like both. We are the Arm Attorney. Today we are talking about a brand new Supreme Court decision which has reigned in the Second Amendment. We're going to talk about what the court held, why the court decided to restrict the Second Amendment and restrict the holding and reasoning of Bruin. And finally, we're going to talk about what this means for other Second Amendment restrictions going forward. But before we get started, share your support for the Second Amendment by hitting the like button. And today's video is brought to you by our friends at Aura. You may have received the dreaded letter about AT&T's data breach, which revealed the private records of former and current customers, and now all of that sensitive information is on the dark web. It's just one of the major breaches that happen every single year. But there's a way to protect yourself, and that's why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, Aura. You've heard me tell this story before. I tried it out for myself. I googled one of my sister's phone numbers and immediately found her home address, which is pretty horrifying because uh, as a former felony prosecutor, her information is supposed to be hidden by law. But that's where Aura comes in. Aura has almost every internet safety tool you'll ever need all inside one app. The app features a VPN, password manager, real-time credit and identity theft monitoring, internet parental controls, and protection for devices from malware. These tools are crucial if you want to protect your bank and social media accounts or other sensitive information. And on top of data breach notifications, Aura proactively identifies data brokers exposing your information on the dark web. They'll even submit opt-out requests for junk mail and telemarketing lists. Or is always on, provides incredible peace of mind, and does all the hard work of keeping you safe online. Better yet, if you sign up right now, Aura will give you a 14-day free trial with our link. So if you value your privacy as we do, go to Aura.com slash armed attorneys to start your free trial, also linked in the description below. And so today we're talking about uh, the United States versus Rahimi. Now this case, we'll throw the case citation up on the screen if folks want to check that out. Uh, we got the opinion on June the 21st, 2024, and this, you know, focused on uh, Mr. Rahimi. He was charged with unlawful possession by a prohibited person, specifically 18 U.S.C. 922 G8. That's our prohibition on folks who are under certain types of protective orders. Now, uh, Mr. Rahimi, they found against him in the district court, went up to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, they reversed the decision, um, finding, hey, guess what? There was no historical analog to this protective order prohibition. Mm -hmm. And then it was appealed to the United States Supreme Court. And we have been saying this for a long time. And we called this case saw it coming. Uh, bad facts make bad law. And that's what we got here. So what is our court holding? Yes. So I won't say that I'm happy about this decision at all. But I am always a little bit happy when I'm right. Yeah, glass half full. Glass half full. Because we called it. Because Mr. Rahimi not a good person and the fear sort of all along was that the supreme court was going to do the thing that judges do all the time which is decide what outcome they want and then reason to get that outcome and i think you see the facts of this case and you learn about mr rahimi as a human being and there are lots of people who are going to look at him and say he doesn't need to have guns. And I think that's exactly what happened. And that's where the facts brought them. Yeah, they kind of did backwards math. I think so. Found out the outcome they wanted and worked their way there. And we've been keeping track of this. And for those of you at home who want to know how to like predict and, you know, have a crystal ball into Supreme Court decisions, uh, what we've been looking at is who has been authoring opinions in each session or term of the court. Each justice, uh, associate justice, usually authors six or seven opinions. And so we were left scraping the bottom of the barrel. We're near the end of the term. We were left with John Roberts and Amy Coney Barrett. And so seeing a 8-1 Roberts opinion, I mean, we've seen that coming for a couple of weeks and knew that that was going to be bad news. Uh, but I'll say it's not you know, even though this isn't necessarily the opinion that we wanted, we do see a reaffirmation of Bruin and of Heller by the majority. So even the liberal justice is joining them. Sure. So, I mean, it, this is actually, you might have gone like this when Richard said 8-1, because that's not generally how we get severe Second Amendment decisions. Um, but that is what we have here. And I think it's because, again, we've got the conclusion that most people want but you would i mean if you look at this opinion it's over 100 pages long the reason being they all wanted this with the exception of justice thomas yep Saint great thomas. we'll cover that yes um but you've got the conclusion they all wanted but they all wanted it for different reasons so you have the majority opinion in which eight justices joined but then you have 
everybody's got to get their own thing in. Yep. Every single one of them. So that it's not a 103 page decision. It's majority opinion, concurrence, 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 because everybody's got to have a say. So ultimately, what we have is what is held by the court is that someone who is placed under a restraining order, restraining them from physically harming their significant other or child, can in fact be denied their Second Amendment rights. There is analogous regulation from 1791 which allows it um, and the primary example they're relying on for their analogous regulation is surety bonds peace yeah. bonds right so what is that richard yeah so this is how the court kind of bases its reasoning they say okay and they apply or they say they apply the standard in New York State Pistol and Rifle Association v. Bruin, where we look at the text of the Second Amendment. Um, as informed by history and tradition, we look at the types of laws that were in place at the time of the adoption of the seven, Second Amendment in 1791, and they find surety or going armed with laws, and they say, you know, this is where the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals messed up. Uh, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals was looking for a twin law or something that would close, you know, be almost identical mirror. And that's not what New York State Rifle and Pistol Association requires. They say we just need it to be analogous enough to kind of overlap and show, hey, this is an interest that was controlled at the time. And so our peace bonds, these were bonds that folks would um, and we'll, we have some input from Thomas here and we'll get to it, I mm. promise. Uh, but these are bonds people would place up so that if they breach the peace that they would forfeit their bond it was a collateral put up so that they behave themselves um the same thing going with armed to terrorize laws those you know we had restrictions on people who said hey guess what if you go out to terrorize the public um we can place restrictions on you and so this is where the majority says the authority lies in um this is being a close enough analog uh, analogy to a uh, protective order um but i don't think I mean, I don't really buy that. No. Well, and they also reference affray laws, which um, this was a new one for me. I'm not a history buff. Maybe you were aware of affray laws. Nope. I was No. Affray laws. So going on an affray, you would go armed and get on horseback and go terrorize the land. That was prohibited. And so they anal analogize it to that, too. Like, oh, you can't just have a gun and terrorize people, and you couldn't in 1791, and so... That's our, you know, I guess, preemptively taking a gun away from someone law, um, which is interesting. And I think they had to do that because the problem I have, and I know, and we've gotten this comment on the channel before where they're like, do you really want these bad wife beaters to have guns? And it's like, I don't want anybody to get hurt with a firearm who doesn't absolutely deserve it. So like... Thank you, all the pol politicians who are like, what do you like better, moms or guns? Well, it's not either or. You can like both. You had uh, you had a representative say that to your face one time. I did, in fact. She said, what are more important, Miss Taylor, moms or guns? How'd you answer? I said, you are not going to have me go on record saying I think it's okay for moms to be killed with guns. Yeah, that's um, a reasonable response. But so anyway, that neither here nor there. But so anyway, so it's not about do you want bad people to have guns it's about is it reasonable to restrict someone who has not been convicted of criminal activity are they guilty until proven innocent for the purpose of the second amendment and that's always been an issue i've had with this particular law and i think they had to they had to tie in these affray laws essentially to give some example of taking guns away from someone who hadn't actually done the bad thing yet. Yeah, and I, I think this is probably a great time to talk about Thomas's dissent, and then we can talk about what this means mm -hmm. in the bigger scope of other infringements um, under 18 U.S.C. 922 G. Uh, but Thomas, I think, does a very good job of picking this apart, um, explaining, hey, look, um, all these examples you're using, there are legitimate reasons why they fall flat on their face. Mm -hmm. um, the peace bonds, well, guess what? That never deprived the person of the right to keep and bear arms. Right. They just put up collateral. Yeah. No, they still had guns. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. And these uh, going armed to terrorize, these were tailored for a specific person to protect the general public, mm -hmm. um, not these extremely specific circumstances. And so right. that and wouldn't keep the person from being armed. Yeah, exactly. So it was like, you can't do that, but that person was not completely prohibited from having firearms. Right. And, you know, uh, uh, so it was, yes, it's, if you ask me, 
the the affray laws if i'm really thinking about it are probably a historical analog for like a disorderly conduct yep already right? a crime um or a um like you know in texas we have this law that says if you're committing other crimes you can't do that with a gun yep. maybe maybe right yep possible historical analog yeah going armed yeah yeah but not for this. No. Not for this. So I think Thomas does do a good job in distinguishing them. But of course, he is the lone dissenter. Yeah. And, you know, I think the thing that he is correctly predicting also in his dissent is, hey, look, you are expanding the scope of New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin. You know, we have this very clear test for whether a second amendment infringement fails or not, does not fail. And this is going to expand the scope to fit more modern regulations under kind of that umbrella. But we have um, another justice, I think, pushing kind of in a different direction, but it happens to be kind of going in the same direction as Thomas talking about what this does not cover. Yeah, so Alito writes a concurrence, and you can tell that he's like mildly uncomfortable that this might be pushed further. Like he wants... He's obviously joined the majority. He's okay with this outcome, but he wants to be very clear that he's not okay with it getting real big. So um, we have his concurrence in which he talks about, I mean, I think one limitation in scope that's very important is this 922G8. There are, you know, different qualifiers such that a protective order fits into the 922G8 box. And there's an either or here. It's Either the order finds that the person is a credible threat to that spouse or child, or that the order on its face explicitly prohibits the use, you know, of physical force against the person. And, you know, that's a lot of orders, right? That second, that part B, yeah. right? That's the divorce orders in Texas, the yep. standard orders that get entered. Just say, hey, don't go like hitting each other, stalking each other, harassing each other, threatening each other over the course of divorce. Same way it says like, don't yeah, rob. Yeah, don't drain the bank account. Don't drain the bank account, right. Yeah. So um, that is very different from a judge actually finding and placing into an order that the person is a credible threat. And what we had here was that exact thing. that The judge in Rahimi's order said, this guy is a credible threat to his intimate partner. And so Alito does make very clear that this does not cover, this opinion does not cover an order that doesn't find that. So if you're talking about the temporary orders in Texas yeah. that just say, hey, don't go hurt each other, this Rahimi does not touch that. That is a different question that was not before the court. What else is restricted? I'm just going to Look at Alito's concurrence where I've highlighted it and tell you exactly because it is very instructive. Um, so the court does not resolve the issue we just talked about. They do not resolve whether the government can disarm people permanently, right? So all those like felon in possession laws and things that are already being challenged, this has no effect on. We do not determine whether 922 G8 can be constitutionally enforced against a person who uses a firearm in self-defense. So if I'm under a protective order and I have to use a gun to defend myself, can you actually tell me that I committed a crime? Right. Okay, and finally, nor do we purport to approve in advance other laws denying firearms on a categorical basis to any group of persons a legislature happens to deem, as the government puts it, not responsible. So this is not endorsing any other firearm restriction except specifically what Rahimi was under, very specifically what he was under. Yeah, and I think the the kind of telltale sign for, you know, when you're seeing these Second Amendment infringements being challenged, things I think y'all should be looking for. Is there some kind of due process requirement? Is there some kind of court mm -hmm. evaluation? Okay, is there, and then we look at this kind of historical analog. Obviously, we got to fall back to the Second Amendment. We got to fall back to the test in New York State Rifle and Pistol Association. But it seems to be those are the two kind of things this court is really hanging its hat on. You know, we they say they have a historical analog, and it looks like they really put a lot of stock in the fact that there was some due process. Um, and then third thing, but I'll say this seems more minor, is that it was a temporary, you know, these things are temporary deprivations. They're not mm -hmm. lifelong deprivations. So if we're seeing these alarm bells going off, um, those are those factors appearing in other circumstances. I think that's what people need to be looking out for. Yeah, absolutely. But um, although this 
is the last this session this is not the last we're going to see of this the supreme court will have to touch these other restrictions in 18 usc 922 but it is anyone's guess what's going to happen but we hope you enjoy this discussion. If you did, consider subscribing, hitting that like button, and help us fight the anti-2A algorithm by sharing this video. And please comment for us below. Do you think this was the right call by the Supreme Court? Until next time, we're the Arms Attorneys.